Thank you for tuning in to Cop with Comic. I'm Brian Cop, and we're with Comic Curtis Rutherford. Curtis Rutherford, how the hell are you? I'm pretty good. How the hell are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for coming on because you wrote the book on improv. Uh, sort of. I, I wrote the <laughs> podcast on improv. There's yes. many, many, yes, many, many books, but yeah. But yeah, if you, I follow yeah, I follow you here on Instagram and Twitter. You're actually Curtis, but you also have CurtisRutherford.com, and there we can see that CurtisRutherford.com/slash/improv is where we can find about find out about your podcast, which is uh, Improv Beat by Beat. Mm-hmm. And that's where you just fucking you talk to all these fucking top improvisers, including former guest Joe Leonardo. And um, at some point, you did you did you write it down into some sort of book form? No. Um, so what it is, is it's much more kind of like, uh, almost think of it like an oral history, but still completely oral without. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, usually those things are written down. Yes, I guess exactly. not. I guess not. So it's much more of rather than like, like this podcast where it's, you know, one episode, one guest, the idea was one episode, one topic. So that way I could focus on different concepts in improv. Like, oh, if you want to do musical improv, which like Doug Wydick, who I know has been yeah, on the show. Yeah, former guest. Does a, exactly. He does like a lot of that. It's like, oh, let me talk to, you know, five to ten different musical improvisers uh, and get their ideas and then kind of splice it together news magazine style into one episode. That is so cool. Um. Yeah, I'm very happy with the results, and I'm very happy with how people have, it seems to have helped people. They, they like it a lot. It's also just an ungodly amount of work, and I... Because <laughs> you have to cut it all together. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> scheduling, you know, I mean, as you know, like, scheduling comedians is never fun, and, you know, <laughs> all of that Especially stuff. the improv, improv, improvisational variety, because you would think that their life is just, you know, all right, maybe I'll go on the podcast, I'll schedule, we'll see if I'm going to show up, right? exactly ah so but but i think that um wow i'm looking at so each of these things and so somebody like joe leonardo or douglas weidick if they have like you know douglas weidick can talk of course about musical improv but if you can also talk about a different subject you might you know douglas weidick might appear on several different episodes of your podcast he might you know appear talking on the musical improv one and he might also talk about you know one of the uh, one of the other improv topics and what are some of those topics so um, some of them have to do with like the nitty gritty of improv. So there's things like in UCB improv, the important thing is game. Like essentially, what is the fun part of the sketch or scene? Oh. Continue doing that fun thing instead of doing like five other not as fun things. So that way you're building it up into one big laugh or several big laughs, many big laughs, rather than just, oh, little laugh, little laugh, little laugh, disconnected yeah. jokes, right? Okay. And so there's a bunch of episodes about how do different improvisers both like teach game to people and how do they kind of like learn it. Um, I've got some episodes. The most recent one was about uh, UCB New York shutting down. And so I got a bunch of people to kind of talk about their feelings with that. But most of the others are kind of concept related. Okay, how do you do uh, in improv? There's this thing called the Herald. Yeah. Which like three scenes, then you do a group scene and then you sort of do like what are called second beats of those three scenes. So you like return to the first three scenes and see like the equivalent of a next episode or a continuation. Wow. And you bring them all together. It, exactly. And then as wow. they go, it kind of continues the ideas like almost like a pyramid. Like then you do another group scene and then the three scenes come back a third time. Where at this point, the whole world is like melding together, right? Wow. It's this thing kind of invented by Del Close and some other like terrible drug addled 70s <laughs> comedians, you know, like all of the people who are unconscionably bad. Uh, so, but good, in, the good at improv. Though. And all of this stuff. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so they might the, be, yeah, they might be drug addled, but they're good at improv, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But then do you have um, to do that then? Like knowing that you're going to come back around a second time and a third time, do you have to make sure that the several scenes are, you know, almost like if, if you know that you're going to be building a pyramid, you, you, you better make sure that your foundation is close enough together where you can build on top of all three, you know, foundational stones or whatever. Oddly enough, it's actually kind of the opposite. It's almost huh. like if you've watched a lot of Curb, you know, there's episodes where you're like, I know how these two side 
how these two plots, how the A plot and the B plot are going to connect. Mm-hmm. I know Larry's going to yell at this guy and then she's <laughs> going to turn out to be the chef that he's been trying to hire or like yeah. whatever. Right? Like when it's too close, you kind of see it. But then like a mm-hmm. good episode of Curb or a great episode, you're like, what is with this weird side plot of Jeff Garland trying to fix his car? And then like last second it connects or something, right? Yeah, but like somebody like somebody like me though, like although yeah, being able to see it coming is not a good thing. I also think there there might be a risk inherent in why am I watching the subplot and plot of him with a car? Like you're like, sure. you know, like during the foundational moments, it's like why am I watching this bizarro thing? And I know although there's the payoff and the payoff will be great, I might turn off. Like I don't think I've ever watched a full episode of Curbed. <laughs> and that's why kind of each one still needs to stand on its own. Like the goal yeah. isn't. The connection, the connection is really a cherry on top mm-hmm. of, oh, we have these three scenes. Sometimes they never really connect. Like, that's kind of the interesting thing of the way different groups, especially different groups across the world now doing heralds and other long form improv uh, forms, they'll do it in different ways. And for some, the connection isn't important at all. Uh-huh. So it's really much more about the how do you build the different beats, yeah. which again, like, Oh, I've got an episode just on how do you deal with second beats and third beats? How do you deal with those group games when the whole team, which is normally like mm, six to eight people, depending on where you are, sometimes more, sometimes fewer. But like, how do you do those group scenes? Because as you, I'm sure you can imagine, if you have five people on stage all trying to do something, that's very different than having just like two people on stage right. trying to build a reality together. And so, yeah, so what is a group game then? So group game, generally you have, let's say if there's eight people on t- on the team, you might have all eight out there together, right? Okay. Sometimes they'll start with like all eight of them. And the idea is often because you have so many more people, sometimes those scenes have to build a little bit more slowly because everybody has to agree on everything. Wow. Right. If it's <laughs> like, oh, that's a ship off in the distance coming. No, but if anybody says like, ah, I think it's a spaceship. Well, now it's completely different, right? Yeah. But if everybody feels like it's a uh, ship on the ocean, then that needs to be like addressed. And that way everybody can say that, right? Ah. Oh yeah. It's coming right over the horizon. Uh Oh, it's got a pirate flag. Oh no. (laughs) Pirates, pirates again. Like everybody is adding just a bit. Yeah. But they, we have to be very careful with eight people not to be like, uh oh, pirates, pirates again. I love pirates. I hate pirates. Yeah. Then now it's like suddenly there's, you know, too maybe many not. different things. Yeah. Maybe it shouldn't be pirates. Maybe it should be something related, like a privateer or something. Exactly. I love that. I mean, yeah. like, because you need a yes and, but, you know, eight people agreeing on anything is difficult, right? Absolutely. And that's why the general rule is agree first. Yeah. And then you can figure it out from there because a lot of the things that we would do as like either in stand up or in writing where it's like, oh, let me repitch this joke. I think this is good. But what if we what if it were this instead? What if it were privateers instead of pirates? Right. Yeah. Like as comedians, those are things that we care deeply about. And there are comedic differences between the two. But. If you are building it in the moment, you can't kind of revise in that way. Yeah. You have to accept everything that's come before is true. Um, so it changes the way that you're approaching it, which often makes kind of the difficulty going one direction to the other, either stand up to improv or improv to stand up. There's, you know, different, uh, different motivations and there's also different accommodations that the audience is giving on each side. Yeah, but I, I always thought that, though, like, if I was the eighth person to speak in an improv scene, though, I just assumed it was like telephone. It's like, I have to wait till it gets around to me. Like, like, do we all have to agree it's a ship before we proceed? Or isn't the eighth person just kind of dealing with whatever it is by the time he gets to that point in the telephone? Like, all right, by the time I got to it, somebody made it a privateer Mm -hmm. instead of a pirate. So although I don't like this, I can't change it in a meaningful way to spaceship. So I I mean, is the so if there's eight people in the scene, do eight people need to agree before they proceed to kind of the next plot point? Or is the eighth person person just kind of dealing with it? So they need to agree, but they don't have to agree verbally. Right. So it's like, oh, there's a ship. We know it's a it's a sailboat, let's say. Right. Oh, there's a sailboat off in the distance, right? If 
the second and third people are like, damn, that's got some big sails. <laughs> that sailboat, look at the sexy sails on that sailboat, whatever it is, right? right? We now know it's a sailboat. The eighth person now doesn't have to repeat that like sailboat information. Right. That is now set in stone. And now all eight of us, because it's it been said and repeated, we can now assume, oh, that is concrete. That is a foundational truth of our reality. Right. And so the eighth person, it doesn't have to be, which sometimes you will see this in bad improv. Oh, look, a boat. Yeah, a boat. Wow, a boat. That is a boat. It's a boat, right? <laughs> which I think is what you're talking about of like, yeah, that would be terrible if then the eighth person is like, well... Seven other fucking people just said this. Is it my uh, turn? Oh, yeah, a boat. Okay, let's see. But, you, but you're, yeah, but you're saying by the time it gets to the second go around, you know, the eighth person. So even if the eighth person added, oh, it's got a medical medical symbol on it. Yes. You know, okay, well, then when the when the first person talks again, and I don't know if they all talk in order, that's how clues on improv I am. But, like, that's the truth. We know it's a sailboat. We know it's coming over the horizon, and we know it's got a red flag on it, so it's probably a hospital boat or some shit. So that's the truth. And the second, the, the, in the second go around, like, who speaks next? Like, it's not in order, right? Like, the first yeah. person doesn't get it, his or her turn again, right? It often depends on the context of the scene or just kind of sometimes whoever wants to talk. Um, sometimes you will have scenes that like go in order. Those tend really? to be hard because especially if it's like uh, that feeling of like pitching a joke when three other people have pitched on it. And it's like, well, my, my pitch has to be better than all three of those other pitches. Yeah. That kind of in order in a line is I think not the greatest way to do it. Often it's kind of like whoever feels like saying something kind of with the natural give and take of actors in a scene, right? Like if you're watching a play, it isn't like, well, Harold said this and then Jeanette said this and then she, you know, it isn't just like these four, five characters going one, two, three, four, five. Right. One character might, uh, you know, go off to the side and he might do the dishes for a little while. Yeah. And then he pops in with a little bit, right? Uh. Like, do you, guys, do, you, do you guys do that on stage where you break out? Like, say, I mean, I, and I guess what we're doing is a big old improv thing where the truth is that we're dealing with an eight person troop, all of <laughs> whom are on stage. But in that situation, like, do, have two people ever kind of broken off and have a side conversation? Because as long as, you, you know, one group is not talking over the other group, that could happen. But that's pretty inventive. I just never seen, I haven't seen enough improv to be like, oh, shit, those two groups are breaking off into subgroups. Does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. And there's different ways that you can do that of if it naturally seems like, oh, these two characters are the most important characters of the scene. Maybe everybody else steps back or leaves the scene. Uh -huh. Sometimes what will happen is like, oh, I'll be in a group game. Let's say we're all waiting for the pirates. And I realize this scene is not going to go anywhere unless the pirates show up. Right. Unless the, uh -huh. the medical pirates. So then I might like peel out behind and come out from the side of the stage or something as wow. one of the pirates. And then maybe the rest of the team does the same thing. And only one person is there. And now we're all the pirates or whatever. Yeah, because you, because you killed the other people who were in the first boat observing the pirates. There's only, <laughs> exactly. there's only pirates left. Oh, that's amazing that you can leave off stage and come back on. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot of the, because uh, because nothing nothing is truly set in stone, right? Like we use these kind of metaphors. I mentioned concrete and foundations earlier, but obviously that's like a metaphor yeah. because everything is so like, we're, we're on a black box stage, right? We're just on a stage. There's nothing there. Um, we have to be very careful about we, what we define as true, yeah. but then we have a lot of like pivot points, right? If I say, oh, we are in the ocean, we are on an island. Well, there's still a lot of like places that can go, right? Okay. I can keep that true, but also like I can climb the palm tree, right? <laughs> I can dig up treasure. Yeah. Uh, the Titan, I could, the Titanic could uh, go right by us. Whatever it is that still feels true within that is completely acceptable. And, and I guess I'm probably a little bit hard on myself. You know, I took one improv class and I never went back because I think I'm a little bit, you know. You know, I like control, of course, so I preferred stand-up. But I'm a little bit hard on myself, too, in that I think I would say something wrong. You know, mm -hmm. it's like like when you get all this experience, of course, 
you know, like, so if I was an improv for 10 years, of course, I'd be super confident. I wouldn't be hard on myself because I would know what's wrong and what's not. But like, right. I think at the beginning as an improv person, do, did you find yourself scared to speak? Because what if you break certain of these rules? It was a lot, maybe it's just because of kind of like, uh, I did a little bit of both. Sometimes okay. it was like, oh, what's the right move? And you can watch people sometimes, especially early in improv, get that feeling. We'll call it hugging the back line because in <laughs> New York and LA, you're often standing on the back and Chicago people stand on the side. But oh. uh, so like, they'll just hug the back. They'll like have their hands pressed up against the back wall and like looking for a moment, like, should I be entering the scene? Yeah. Do they need me? Should I edit this scene? Like, yeah, that sort of thing can definitely happen. And it is kind of like anything else where like, as you learn the rules, you become more confident in what will and won't work, right? Yeah. Like, I'm sure there's times, you know, like, even with stand up, ultimately, the audience is the arbiter of what is funny or not, right? But I bet you have written a joke and thought, this is going to kill or this is going to do well. And yeah. it has, right? Like sometimes you get that feeling over time of like, this is what will work or, Oh, this joke that works. I know I can adjust this even without hearing the audience's response to this adjustment. Yeah. I know if I say privateer rather than pirate, it's going to land just that smidgen harder when I, okay. right. Yeah. And that's like a, a sixth sense that you've built up. And with improv, it's very similar. It's like, yeah, it's kind of scary at first. And then you build up this sixth sense of, oh, am I constantly uh, agreeing with the people around me? Am I constantly listening to them? And uh, am I building in fun ways? Like, am I adding enough information with my lines? Right. Yeah. yeah. But, I, but, I, but I like that. First of all, I'm going to use hugging the back line going forward. I'll be like, uh, you know, whenever an improv comic comes down, I'll be like, uh, you were hugging the back line and I'm going to sound <laughs> yes. super, super smart. But I'll, I'll, of course, you know, I'll mention uh, Curtis Rutherford. Uh, but I guess the question I have is that, you know, when you're in a new troupe with newbies and maybe this never happens, but, you know, like if you're new to improv and you're, you're coming up with the same new people and I, I would think that if you're all hugging the back line, or you're all like, you're all learning the hard way, like, oh, shit, we just talked all over each other. And I think that's why I don't like watching improv, because maybe I've seen bad improv where, you know, it's like these people are talking all over each other. And that's not really how it works in real life. And maybe that comes from the fact that eight people aren't usually, you know, talking <laughs> or in a scene at the same time, I suppose, if you go to you know, a party or something. But, you know, it, and that's why it doesn't feel as real to me as other art forms, I think. And so is there anything about watching new improv that turns you off because these people are, they're still learning, but they're learning the hard way and in a way that's cringeworthy to the audience? Um, absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely. It's like if you if you go to an open mic night, right? And you will <laughs> yeah, see- Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, right? you just you reminded me that the same thing is true, yeah. And you'll see the good stuff and then you'll see like, oh, well, that was just five white guy comics in a row talking about jerking off, right? Like with five sure. minutes of, uh, oh, uh, jerk off material, right? Uh, <laughs> hey, who here, who else <laughs> smokes weed, right? And I smoke like, with this bong. My bong is red. <laughs> my bong is blue. I, I use lotion for my jerking off. I use, you know, hand sanitizer. I love that. Yeah, to as a perfect example to remind. However, I guess my, my point to that is that yeah, they're both equally cringeworthy for the audience, but like that doesn't really get improv off the hook. Like you still are <laughs> providing cringeworthy moments for audiences. Like usually there's not an audience at an open mic, right? But there probably is an audience for a beginning beginner's improv troupe and it might turn them off improv forever, right? Possibly, but actually for, for beginner's improv, that's often like, it would often be a class show or something uh, like that. There's off, There's also things called like jams where it's uh, like I hosted one for a long time, actually with Joe Leonardo and some other people oh, cool. in New York, where the idea is like, oh, like me, Joe and a bunch of other experienced improvisers would uh, would host and everybody in the audience would like put their name in a hat. And then we'd like pull out like four names and then two or three of us would do a set with them. So that way we could kind of like coat you know, 
coach them through, or not coach them through, but we could kind of be supportive That's cool. with them, right? And so people in the audience were kind of beginner improv people who wanted to be called up? Exactly, right? Uh-huh. So we didn't get a lot of the like, let me check out improv. Oh, this is bad type people. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you're new to improv, like in the same way that if you're new to stand up, you sh- probably shouldn't go to an open mic or you shouldn't go to like the show right after the open mic. Yeah. You should instead like see, you know, whoever, Chris, Ryan, like all these all these amazing people yeah. with improv. Yeah, probably like um, like at they're uh, often the weekend shows and a lot of theaters are like where they put a lot of their better talent for a lot of improv uh, yeah. theaters. And You're so, like, come um, back you know, on the weekend. The doorman's exactly. like, I'm sorry, come back on the weekend. That's exactly it. Because yeah. those are often like they're, they're much better improvisers who are going yeah. to show you more of what can be fun about improv. Yeah. And so going back to what you mentioned of like the watching a bad improv show, you're kind of only seeing the bad. There is some good there, and you'll only see it occasionally. Again, like with an open mic, where every once once in a while, you'll hear somebody who has like a slightly different voice from everybody else, or somebody will like have, have like a weird, fun observation that's like, "Oh, I want to think about that for the next five years." <laughs> right? Sometimes with beginner improv, because you're still learning the rules they'll do something unexpectedly and they'll have like this, I've invented penicillin. <laughs> like look on the, like, I I've just invented one of the pirates. Technique. That's hilarious. Exactly. It's like, wait, we were all waiting on the island and I became a pirate and everybody else became a pirate. We're allowed yeah. to become the pirate. Like, That's cool. It's cool like to know, like, you know, the long, you know, the, the, the gray hairs, the people who've been in um, improv a long time can even stumble upon something new and the newbie won't even know <laughs> yes. that it's something new because his or her experience is so limited. And I love I, I loved this. Like even with Patrick McCartney on there, I, I, I learned so much about just cool shit that improv could do. And I think I had the same experience today with the whole, oh, they could break off into subgroups. Oh, they can go off stage and come back on stage. Like, like I'm, you know, talking to the, the improv pros like Curtis Rutherford, like I'm finding out these things and it really speaks well to the improv beat by beat. So when is that coming out? When's the next episode? And what's it going uh, to be about? A uh, very good question. So right before uh, COVID hit, I was interviewing. So I had just moved from New York. I'm now in L.A., um, I don't know why I said it like that. I'm now in <laughs> L.A. Um, but, so now in Los Angeles, uh, I'd started interviewing some improvisers out here and then everything hit and I kind of lost a lot of the steam for it. Yeah. But new episodes come out. This is not helpful, but approximately when I get material for it. <laughs> so hopefully within the next month or so, I'll kind of like keep going with uh each episode, because it's often, you know, four to eight people, yeah. it's, oh, I need to do eight total interviews to get then eight episodes worth of stuff, right? And there's a lot of, like, overlap between that of, oh, great, I just talked to whoever, like, oh, okay, I talked to Caroline, and she gave me this information for this episode, but also these other five episodes, can I get more for this other thing? <laughs> dude, That's well, a long well, way of saying I have no idea. Well, dude, I, I like the fact that it's cool for us to have you organize the information in this fashion. But I'm also sorry that you have to do all this clipping together. But you're doing the Lord's work. And so that's why we follow you on Twitter and Instagram. You were actually Curtis. But also CurtisRutherford.com is where we're going to find at the improv backslash or the, the improv sub page. We're going to find out. Uh, you know, kind of where to link to some of these master classes in improv. So Curtis Rutherford, thank you so much. Thank you so much.